family vision. And um, you say, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm young. I'm just section over here. The young section over here. Uh, I waved them in the young section over here. Look at that. Look at that. Everybody, look at, look, everybody's waving in the young section over here. Yes. What, that's about me. I don't mind. Listen, I'm going to plant seed for you today for, for vision for future. You say, well, man, you know, my kids are grown, this and that. I don't have any. Listen, this is the family of God. You have a family. And this is your family. So what I'm sharing today, I'm sharing about how you can, you have to plant seed. You have to plant. You, can, you, have, to, you have to sow for what you want to see. It doesn't come by accident. Doesn't, it, has to, it comes by vision. It comes by sight. It comes by what you speak and say this morning. So, Father, I just ask you, Lord, but on this word, Lord, I'm going to just captivate this word in this moment. I know we got a lot happening, but, Lord, I, it's, it's about the power of vision, the power of family, and the power of vision. Vision starts with seeds. Now, Father, I ask you, Father, Lord, that you would just uh, anoint these words of, of my mouth. Lord, I ask that your presence be here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Ephesians 2.19 says that now you are no longer strangers to God. That's what happens when you get saved in the house of God. You become a believer. It says you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven. But you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you, be- and you belong. Say belong. See, the enemy will always tell you you never fit somewhere. I'm telling you, the enemy works in lies in his mind. He wants to make people think you don't fit. I'm going to show you the word of God that you do. It says, in God's household with every, uh, with every Christian, every believer, in 1 Timothy 3.15 says this, that God's family is the church of the living God. Say amen. God's family is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the foundation of truth. And I come to this conclusion that, that you are called to belong and not just believe. You are called to belong to a family of God, not just believe. You see, when you follow Christ, fight, uh, following Christ means belonging, just not just believing. The Word of God tells me that I was created for a community. I was fashioned for fellowship, and I was formed for family, and I cannot do this by myself. You know, nowhere in the Word of God do I hear that you are called to be a spiritual hermit. Deprived of fellowship from the house of God. And the enemy will always try to make you think that you don't fit anywhere. So we go to here, we try to fit, we go here, I don't fit here, I don't fit here. It's like, listen, the word of God says this, you belong to a family. You got to let the de- devil wipe this out of your mind, always telling you, I don't know where I fit. So we become isolated. Listen, nowhere in the word of God have you called you to be isolated from the family of God. You're supposed to fit in the family of God. You're supposed to put your hands to something in the family of God. Not just sit back and say, well, I don't know. Listen, we know we're not called to be spiritual hermits. Look, look at the word of God says this. It says that we are put together, fitted together, joined together, held together, built together. Then one day before, one day before that trump sounds in the sky, we're going to be caught up together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But when you got the word vision, is this. you got to picture something in your heart and mind, something that has not happened yet. Hasn't happened yet. It's not happening now. It's present tense. It's, it's about to happen or coming to happen. And every vision has to start off with something. It has to start off with seed. Seed is a powerful thing. When seed gets planted into the ground or something, it will produce something. But it has to start off with a seed of faith. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 17. He says that if you have a mustard seed of faith, you can say to this mountain or speak to this mountain, go here and there, and the mountain will move. Seed is a very, very powerful thing because seed will produce something good or bad. Seed will produce. So what I want to talk about today, this morning, is that seed, faith, and vision, and it's a principle. It's a principle. God works in principles. I'm going to talk to you a few minutes this morning about a principle here in, in, in seed. It's called the principle of sowing and reaping. You see, sowing and reaping is just like this. Word of God says this in Galatians 6. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Here's a principle here. 
For whatever a man sows, that will he reap also. That is a principle. That is a law of life that cannot be changed. For if you sow to the flesh, you will also reap to the flesh. Corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, eternal things, you will also reap everlasting life. And I went on to tell you this morning that a principle is irrevocable. Meaning it can't be altered or it can't be changed. God is a God of principle. He's not a God of circumstance or emotions or feeling. He doesn't work. He works by his word. So when there is a principle that is involved in something, and that principle cannot be changed. God has to honor his word more than what you're feeling right now. His principle is his word. And he has to honor his word. See, listen, principles work when they are applied. If you do this, then this will happen. If you don't do this, then this won't happen. It's a principle. Principles, when applied, work anytime, anywhere, in any place. Because why? It's the principle of it. The second thing about seed is this. Seed is this. That you will reap what you sow. Everybody pray for a crop failure sometimes. You will reap what you sow. Good or bad. That's why you have to watch what you speak when you're looking at something. This morning... Brother Johnny came up to him this morning and said the doctor gave him a bad report, right? And I said, and I want to say, Brother Johnny, sometimes you have to see, you have to show what you want to see. Brother Johnny, come on up here, Brother Johnny. Give me, uh, give me a favor. Go give me, go give me some all, some, uh, you know what's that, Brother Johnny? Go ahead. Come on. Doctor gave him a, bear, a little bad report today. Understand that. Okay? Oh, they, they stole the all. What happened to the all? Holy Ghost, we're going to get some all in Jesus' name. I know they got it around there somewhere. Who moved them all? We'll come down anyway. I want you to come down anyway. I want you to face me. I want you to extend your hand forward. See, because I'm going to give you a word here today. You have to watch what people speak around you. You have to watch what people speak around you. Because sometimes we, get, we don't realize that we speak and we, and we let people speak. Listen, I'm going to tell you this nicely. Don't watch what you entertain. I'm, I'm going to say that. Watch what, start sowing what you want to see. I want to see myself healed. Start speaking healing. and I'll, Sow. You got to sow in the ground. You got to plant in the ground. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, right now, I speak it right now. Lord, I speak healing in the name of Jesus. I sow it today. I sow complete healing in this man's body in the name of yes, Jesus. Lord. I understand doctor's reports and all of that. I'm not, I'm not, but Lord, I know, I know a great physician. Yes, sir. Lord, I'm in tune with a great physician. I believe in you, Father. Yes, come on. I believe, I believe in you, in Father, you, right Father. now in Jesus' name. And Father, I speak it right now, and I speak it forth now in the name of Jesus. Yes, it's your breath right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I speak, I speak divine healing. I sow it today. I sow, it in his, I sow seed into his spirit today. I sow seed into his body today. I sow seed of healing into him today in the name of Jesus right now. And I speak it right now. I speak it forth in the name of Jesus. And that what I sow will we harvest. And that what I sow today will uproot. And that what I sow today will establish and spring forth, says the word of the Lord today. And I speak that over you in the name of Jesus right now, in Jesus' name. I speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See? That's why it's so important that when God gives you a vision, see something, you have to, you have to watch what you say. Because why? Because when seeds, words are like seeds. They plant in the ground, they will take root, and they will, they will come forth. I tell young people, you know, hey, you know, uh, when, you, when you sow, you pray, you sow into something. I'm sowing into something right now. Something that I don't see yet, but I'm sowing into it. I'm believing, I, I'm believing for something, so I have to sow my words. I have to sow prayer. I have to sow, I have to put something in the ground. So it's because why? Because you cannot, listen, you can't reap without sowing. Many people today, they want to reap something, they don't sow anything. When you sow, it's an investment. When you sow something in, I'm investing in. 
If you don't sow anything in, what are you going to reap? Yeah, that's exactly. That's why it says don't be deceived. Listen, if God tells you to do something, to sow into something, well, I don't care if it's giving or whatever, and you don't sow into it, it's called disobedience. God can't bless disobedience. He can't bless disobedience. And I tell people, listen, young people, this is for young people. Listen, you're out there looking for a man. I'm looking for a husband, I'm looking for whatever. Be specific about what you want. Don't just pray for anything. Lord, give me a man. You get a man. Young people, here, young women, you're looking for, you're looking for somebody. Go to the story of Ruth and look for Boaz. Come on. Boaz, the Kingsman Redeemer. Look for Boaz in the Bible. I'm looking for Boaz. Because you, you listen, you don't want, listen, you don't want anything but Boaz. If not, you'll get cheap ass, dumb ass, good for nothing ass. Huh? Poor ass. You know what I'm talking about. You know, we got brothers. Dumbass. You get dumbass. Come on. Listen, don't settle for cheap ass when you get a bow ass. Amen? I'm going to speak that to you right now. Come on, Jesus. Come on. You got it. Come on. You're talking about. Come on. Listen, Lord, give me a man. Give me a man. You get any man. Listen, you plant seed in the ground, what you want. You mom and dad, you plant seed in the ground for their, your kids. Lord, this is the kind of husband I want. This is the kind of woman she needs. It's got, listen, you have to sow into what you want to see. If not, you will get anything. Woo! Y'all like that Boaz, huh? Come on. We need some, come on, we need some Boaz, Kingsman Redeemers. We need some Redeemers in the house. His name is Jesus. Come on. See, you got to listen. There's a principle here. And that principle is that, listen, that's why when we say this, so we can't, this, is, this, is, this is out of line. And giving, bless those who give and don't give. Bless them. That's out of line. If God's going to bless me overflow, whether I give or not, I'm not giving. If I'm going to get doubly blessed and all up, guess what? I'm going to keep that $7,000 in my pocket for this year. But it doesn't work like that. A man has to sow first before he can reap. See, today we, today we want to reap without investing. Listen, investing always takes a sacrifice, always takes something. And this is true. You will reap always more than what you will sow. How many going to understand that? You've made a bad decision and you, how many, I, I, don't raise your hand because we all, well, everybody raise your hand at one time, get it over. <laughs> you, will, you will reap more than what you sow, good or bad. How many know you made a bad decision? You went to go buy something, you bought, I did that years ago, went and, went, went and bought a car on emotions. Don't ever buy a car on emotions. Woo! Lord, today. I went in there at Christmas time. And, you know, the dealer, he just, he knew, he knew he had a, he knew he had a my bass, and, a, and my, I knew I was a bass. He knew, I watched this guy. I walked in with two kids at Christmas time. Can I help you? I said, yes, I'm looking for a car. He said, listen, we're kind of late today. Why don't you take this car for a few days and drive it home with your family and come back? I said, good idea. Took that, took that uh, SUV, whatever it was, minivan back then. God knows what it was. Minivan from Hades. Uh, <laughs> took, that, took that minivan home. Drove it around, look at all the luxury space where we had a little bitty, little bit caught as big. You got that minivan with all those seats. Put all those Christmas presents in there. All the above. All of a sudden, guess what? We have to bring it back before de December 31st. So around New Year's Eve, around 9 o'clock that night, I'll bring it back as long as I can. I'll get there. When I got there, I said, Lord, I'm going to turn the keys in. Tell my kids, everybody, nobody squawk, nobody complain. Turn the keys in, nobody complain, nobody do nothing. Everybody my best behavior. Mr. So-and-so, how you like the car? I loved it, but I want to return it back. Oh, Daddy, we love that car. Don't turn it back. <laughs> we love that car, Daddy, you know. <laughs> Where the papers at? <laughs> that van broke down just right outside of warranty. I had to put a new engine in it. Seven air conditioners in it. Seven. That's my wife. Seven air conditioners in this thing. I went in the hospital because of stress. And one day the Lord said, you made a mistake. Repent and sell it. 
I repented, I saw it. That thing went on for 400,000 miles, man. Never did break down once. I, I finally seen the man who I got it from. I said, did this thing ever break down? He said, man, I put 300,000 miles on this thing, and nothing has happened. I said, I know I changed every part in that car. <laughs> but you see that? But you will reap always more good or bad. But listen, what if God says you will reap 30, 60, 100 fold? I believe when I sow into something, I'm going to reap better than when I sow it into. Amen? And the fourth thing is this. You've got to wait on God's timing. Woo! Sometimes seeds come up fast, and sometimes it takes time. But the hardest thing about doing is sowing and reaping is this one word called wait. Oh, don't you stop. I like suddenly and fast and quick. Pow, 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 pow. Sometimes you have to wait. Sowing and reaping requires one thing. It's called waiting on the Lord. Ooh. His timing is better than your timing. Amen? Always. Listen. You have to wait on the Lord. Just because you plant something in the ground, we want instant harvest. We want instant vision. We want to see something immediately. And sometimes things just take time. And usually take, that's that faith time. That's that pause where you have to wait and be still and know that he is God. Amen? I mean, know what I'm talking about here this morning. You guys just got to know that he's God. You just got to wait on the Lord and trust in the Lord. But also, it takes something I'll call today, I'll explain this, call the word sacrifice. Write the definition of sacrifice up there. Sacrifice. It's the surrender of something prized and desired for the sake of something, or having something, a greater price or greater claim. It's something that you desire considered to having a higher price or a higher claim. You see, we sacrifice a lot. We sacrifice a lot for our family, amen? I look back and I realize, you know, when you get older, you think different than when you're young. All, I thought about, you know, when I was young, I used to work all the overtime I could. I would work seven days a week. I would do this and all that. And when I came down to in life, I asked my wife, are we any richer? What, did that time go? Where did ha what happened? You see, I'm talking about investing this morning. Sometimes we invest, we, we invest in our kids, we invest into something, which is good. But sometimes we invest a lot, of, a lot of physical things. We sacrifice for our kids. We sacrifice for family. And sometimes we don't sacrifice and give our kids the spiritual things that they need. We give them earthly things. We punish them and tell them, go play Fortnite in the rest of the room the rest of the night. But you punish your kid, come to youth on Wednesday night. What are we doing? We're saying church is a bad thing. See, we gotta watch. We gotta watch. We gotta watch what we invest. We gotta watch what we say. Because usually our children are gonna come mimic the people who influence them the most. It's called you, mom and dads. Years ago, there was a song. I'm gonna, I'm, you have to Google it. Uh, it was called Cats in the Cradle. It was about to say, yeah, you met all the old folks, shake your, head, shake your head, all the new people, go Google it. Go on your phone right now and go Google it. But it talked about a dad and his son, and his son wanted to play ball with him at a young age, and the dad was always busy working, always busy with something. He said, we'll get the, yeah, son, I want to play, but look, I got things to do, I got things going on, we'll do it later, we'll do it later, I promise you, we'll do it later, we'll do it later. And then, you, then, you know, if, you, if you've been parenting long enough, you know that as kids get into teenage years and they get into that driver's license stage, that you're finding out something that they will need you less. Because when you're younger, you had to be an Uber cab driver and drive them everywhere. They need you for everything, Amen. Yes, I'm, I'm an underpaid Uber cab driver. Trust me, every day at school I pick up kids, but it costs me $8 a day at racetrack. I'm an underpaid cab, cab driver. My grandkids just suck the life out of me, man. <laughs> and when they get older in the song, they really want to do is do one thing. They want to borrow the car keys. 
And then once they get their own car, they need you less and less. And you're looking for more of them, and they need you less and less. They may know what I'm talking about here. Maybe you've been in that. The, the new, this is, I'm telling you, this is fact. If your kids are this big, you ain't experienced it yet. Trust me, you're going to experience this later on. And then the reverse, the roles reversed. And then the song, I had to write this down. It said, the man says, I've long since retired, and now my son, he moved away. I called him up just the other day, and I said, I'd like to see you, if you don't mind, if we got the time. And he said, I'd love to, Dad, I'd love to, if I could find that time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids, they have the flu. But it sure been nice talking to you, Dad. It sure been nice talking to you. But we'll get together then, Dad. It's sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me that he'd grown up to be just like me. Whew. Sometimes we have to watch that we don't get caught up in the physical world of blessing and doing all that without imparting spiritual things to our kids and to our family. Amen. Somebody better say amen. Jesus, come on. You see, our kids will watch the influence of what your priority was. And they will look back and they will see what was important and was not important. Trust me, they will. And they say, you know what? The Lord must not mean a whole lot to you because you, you, you were very vacant in the house of God. You only showed up when it was not, when, you only showed up when either ball season wasn't in play. You only showed up when there was a need. And it just seemed like the Lord wasn't really important to you today because I didn't see you in the morning in your prayer closet. I see you watching ESPN and, 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 and watching fantasy drafts. So when they grow up, they start to mimic what they see. Trust me, I know. And I realize you have the biggest influence on your child, good or bad. And you can buy them all the greatest stuff in the world. But if you haven't spent spiritual time with them, the enemy will try to eat them alive. The enemy always wants your seed. Understand this, people. The enemy wants your seed. So instead of making a man cave, why don't men make a war room? Instead of so worried about my man cave, why don't I get a war room and start warring over my kids? Can I get an amen? You get, you know, listen, you get clapping in the house of God, it's okay. You see, you have to know and understand what they, listen, what they realize and see, they look at somebody else and use you, you're the great, listen, I'm not the, listen, I'm an influence in their life, but I'm not going to be the greatest influence. You as a mom and dad or a, a single mom, guess what, the ball's in your court, don't drop the baton. They will mimic exactly what they see, and they'll know what was a priority and what wasn't a priority. Let me tell you something years ago. I'm going to share this with you. This is, this is me, a personal story. Okay? A kid made the volleyball team at, uh, at high school. And naturally, she makes it, and there's, a, there's a, like a four-month conditioning. I mean, they take sports, you know. The high school takes sports as a god. You know what I'm talking about. Amen. And so they had to prepare them to training and my daughter came up to me and said, I made the team, and I only above, I'm the captain of the volleyball team, I'm the setter, and blah, blah, blah. But guess what, Daddy? I have to be out of church for four months. The coach said we have to practice at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. Oh, at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. Yeah, that's what the coach says. We got to practice. I said, I know one set ain't going to be there. My kid can't afford to be out of church for six months and, his, and, be, and she would go down the hill. I know my kid. You got to know your kid. Not everybody can do this. I'm just saying, I know my kid. And I said, guess what, boo? Your, your teacher is going to have to rearrange your schedule because isn't it amazing that everybody wants to take pictures and, for, for ball every, on 10 o'clock on Sunday morning? It's just, it is, man. It's just, it is what it is. It's like, man, can you pick at 12 or 1 o'clock? No, 10 o'clock. I said, guess what? Go talk to your teacher and tell him that you're missing a setter. His name is Beth Butcher. Okay. Went in. Went in with my teacher. Went in. Parents went in. Because we spoke up. All the parents said, you know what? I don't like that idea neither. 
Now, we would stay in church. Other parents say, we go out at nighttime. We 10 o'clock Tuesday morning. Bring my kids to school. I'm sleeping in bed on Sunday morning. I knew what their motive was. Their motive was, we going to church on Sunday morning. No, we've been out all night. We're going to sleep on Sunday morning. And we ain't bringing a kid. So I'm just being honest with you. The coach changed the volleyball, the schedule at 12 o'clock. Because why? Somebody stood up and somebody stood up and said, this is more important. I, I was trying to teach my kid. It wasn't so much church. It was the value of the Lord, that the Lord's first. See, if you don't instill that in them, then anything and anything can get in their life. And you know what? You know what? Because I know this happened. I know this much. Because at, at, at high school, you have to do do sports. That means after she finishes four months of uh, volleyball, she has to stay conditioned. You've got to put on four months of track and field to stay conditioned and stay loose, right? So it's eight months away. Listen, your kid can't stay eight months out of church. The enemy will eat him alive. Amen? Can I get a hand clap? Amen. Amen. All right. Closing this one statement right here. Here we go. But what happens if we don't, what happens if we do everything right? And you know what? Guess what? We don't, we don't live in a perfect world. Post, you do everything right and your kids fly off the handle. Been there too. You can do everything right, but kids make choices. You can do everything right. You can give, you can tithe, you can do everything. You can get everything. But kids, it's called free will. And you have them just like everybody else has them. And I've been there. When you do everything right, say, when you don't live a double life. You see, when I got saved, I didn't live no double life. When I, when I got saved, I got saved. I didn't understand everything, but when I got saved, we tried, we tried our best to live this life. We didn't do this on Monday and then praise God on Sunday. We tried our best to live this life. But, you know, kids have their own mind, and kids get up and make up their own mind, and they get fooled, and sometimes they get influenced. They go off away, and they go to college and have a whole different philosophy of when they left home. I've been there and done that. We understand that. But there's hope. I'm going to tell you there's hope today. The prodigal son story gives me hope. The two sons had the same upbringing in the house. They seen the love. They seen the affection. They seen everything they had. It wasn't that the parents were living double lives. They seen it all. But the word of God says, but one day the younger son got what? Restless. And he said, I'm going to go out on my own. You know, they'll go out on their own. And as parents, the first thing you want to do, trust me, what did we do wrong? If you did not say that, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you. Baby, what did we do? Did we do everything? What did we do? See, the enemy wants to put a game. It's, it's, you know, you did something. Because it wants to steal your vision. It wants to steal your seed. But in a story, he went off a long ways. But here's what, I'm, here's what I'm, I'm going into. Verse 17 changes the whole story. When he came to his senses, he said to himself, when he came to his senses, at home, even hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger, he said. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long ways off, the father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to that son and embraced him and kissed him. But the father said to the son, Quick, bring to servants, quick, bring the finest robe of the house and put it on him. And give a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Now, where you go, let's go back to verse 17. When he came to his senses. Mm -mm -mm. You can take this 50 different directions. I'm going to take it in one little direction this morning. When he came to his senses. 
I believe he came to his senses because of seed that was planted in his heart. Amen. I believe he came to his senses because seed from his family, the word will not return void. It will accomplish that what it was purposed in. See, even though they went out there for a long ways, I believe seed that was deposited in from his family kept him. Amen? I believe as he went out, that seed that was deep down inside started to spring forth. All that, listen, come on now. All that, all that talk, all those things we went through, all those services, all those prayer meetings, all those things, it didn't run off the track. Somehow or another, it went, the seed went down deep and started to produce. And I believe that's part of why he came to his senses. Because what you plan in, we'll, we'll root up. Come on, Jesus. That's my only hope for you today. What you have planted in, we'll root up. And we'll spring forth in Jesus' name. In the meantime, what you do, you walk around that prayer closet and you start shouting their name out. You start shouting. You don't give up. You don't give in. But I learned something else, though. It's about sowing and reaping. So my wife and I come to the conclusion, if we couldn't help our kid out, we're going to help somebody else's kid out. Come on. If I couldn't help this kid out, I was going to help another family out. I was going to sow something into somebody else believing God was going to sow into my seed. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's called sowing and reaping. Listen, what do I do here? I don't do nothing. No. You know what? We're going to plant ourselves into somebody else's life, somebody else's kid, believing that somebody's going to touch our kid and do what we couldn't. Am I, am I going to amen yet? Amen. And that seed went down deep. What I'm saying is today, you can invest. You don't have to. You invest in somebody else's family. Invest in somebody. Sow seed in somebody. Don't complain. Go invest in somebody else's life. And guess what? Just maybe. Because you sow, God's going to sow something in somebody else's life for your kids. You believe a testimony. It happens. Then one day, somehow or another, sometimes the hardest thing to do is wait on the Lord. But one day you may get a phone call saying, Daddy, I'm coming home. Come on. I serve as testimony that it happens. You just have to wait on the Lord and trust on the Lord. And you have to get up a prayer closet. You have to walk around. You have to call things that are not as though they are. You have to speak truth. You have to speak in the word of God. You have to sow into what you want to see in Jesus' name. But in order to see something, you have to have vision. Pastor Chris, take over from me. We're going to talk about vision. Before we do that, I want you to lift your hands right now. I want you to lift your hands right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus right now, I'm going to sow deep. I want to sow to reap. I'm going to sow to reap now in Jesus' name right now. Lord, I got, Lord, I got seed out there. Lord, in the name of Jesus right now, if I sow forth, Lord, if I invest, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I will reap in Jesus' name. Lord, I, but give me the seed to plant. Give me faith to seed. Give me seed right now in Jesus' name. I speak it right now. Give me seed right now in Jesus' name that when it goes in the ground, it will spring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to take about 10 seconds and give Jesus some praise this morning. There's something that's required in sowing and reaping, sowing for what you want to see. There's something that is extremely important to that principle that he's been preaching about, and that is vision. You have to know what you're sowing for. You have to know what you're sowing for. There has never been a farmer in history who didn't know what he was planting before he planted it, ever. No farmer just went out and just grabbed a random box of seeds and just started throwing stuff. Because each different, you know, there's so much revelation hitting me right now, I might have trouble speaking this. Give me, give me a minute to get in on this. But no farmer takes and just throws seed out because certain plants have to be planted in a certain way because of the way they grow. So if you don't know what you're sowing for, you could end up sowing and contradicting or actually hindering what God's trying to do. So it's so important to know what it is you're sowing for. You have to have vision 
for your family. And today I'm going to give you three ingredients of vision. We're going to cook something this morning. Now, I don't cook. I did fry some shrimp yesterday, but that's the extent. I can do Easy Mac and I can use a deep fryer. That's it. It's all I can do. I'm tapped out after that. But I can make some Easy Mac. But three ingredients that are required for you to have vision for your family. The first is you have to have the right perspective. Say the right perspective. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. Go back to verse 1 for me. If then you were raised with Christ. That first sentence lets me know Paul was only speaking to believers. Because if you're not a believer, you're not seated with Christ. So you can't even see or comprehend the things that are above. But it says here, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above and not what are underneath. We have to understand that, and I want you to really get this because this hit me and, I, and I'm, I'm going to stand on it for a long time. Make sure I say it right. The vision for my family must come from the kingdom, not the culture. I'm going to say that. The vision for my family must come from the kingdom, not the culture. See, I'm in youth ministry, so I, I, I hear all the time the dreams and the goals that parents have for their children. All the time. And they're great. The parents that care have great dreams and vision for their kids. I mean, they really do. They genuinely do. They have fantastic things they want to see happen for their kids. The problem is I meet so many kids that their parents could care less. It's amazing how many kids we have to bring home on a Wednesday night. Some parents work. I get that. But I, I literally have brought kids home on a Wednesday night, and Dad's on the porch smoking a cigarette. He just didn't want to come pick them up. So this does happen. But what I'm saying is, is that we have parents, and if I went around and I asked if I took 10 random people and I asked them, what do you want to see for your kids? We're going, to, we're going to hear things like, I want them to be successful. I want them to have education. I want them to have a good marriage. I want them to have great kids. I want them to, to, to have straight A's. I want them to be the captain of this, the president of this. I want them to do all these different things. Dun, 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 dun. And every single one of those things are fantastic. They're all necessary. You need them. I'm going to say it again. You need them. Those are great goals. You, I'm not diminishing those at all. But what I am going to say is that those things, Things are things beneath. Those are things beneath. Because all of those things are based in this culture, in this society, in this world that we live in. My Bible says in Ephesians 2 that I am seated with Christ, which means that I am a resident of earth, but I'm a citizen of heaven. Let's say that again. I am a resident of earth, but I am a citizen of heaven as a Christian. What does that mean? If you go on a trip to Germany, you're not a citizen of Germany. For that week, you are a resident. You are residing in Germany, but you are a citizen of the United States. For the past 26 years, I have been residing on this planet, but my citizenship is in another kingdom. When I go to Germany... I have to do my best to live according to the laws of that culture. But the way my mind works, my heart works, my emotions work, and my reactions work are from where I'm a citizen. So what I've got to do is I've got to make sure that I am not letting the vision for my family be determined by where I'm residing temporarily. The vision for my family has to come from where my citizenship is. What does that mean, Pastor Chris? What that means is I don't just want my children to be educated, successful, happily married, live in a great house with a great marriage, and make $150,000, $200,000 a year. Those are fantastic. But what I want, I want my child to be successful and anointed. I want my child to have straight A's and prophesy. I want my child to be able to be the captain of the football team or the, or the captain of the dance team and preach the gospel and have people respond and get saved. It's both. Why can't we have both? Because you see what happens. Y'all, I'm about to explode. What, what happens is we usually build one side up and tear the other one down simultaneously. We don't realize it. And I have been guilty of this because I'm obviously a ministry person. And if you didn't know, I'm a ministry person. So growing up, 
I put ministry over everything. If you weren't in ministry, you didn't love Jesus as much as me. That's the way that I thought. And I'm, I know I ain't the only Christian that thought that way. But the thing is, we have to understand that the anointing and the power of God is needed in so many other places than this. <laughs> it's catching slowly. It's catching. It's needed in so many other places. Because if the anointing was only needed here, we wouldn't have any problems. Because it, it should, it's, I know it's here in this church. It's already here. No, the anointing is needed at dance practice. The anointing is needed on the baseball field. The anointing is needed at, at the 4-H meeting, at the academic games. It's needed all over the place. But the thing is, we, we, we overemphasize one and tear down the other. One of the, one of the coolest things I, I've seen this year, we came back from youth camp. And if you were here that Sunday morning, I spoke and four of the youth leaders spoke with me. And I'm friends with Brandon and Mindy Wilson on Facebook because it's one person. And... For, I mean, if you follow them, they're, they're always posting about their kids. And I can remember when, when Brandon got, when he, when he uh, committed to Loyola, they had the pictures and it was talking about how great Brandon is and his big posts and pictures of Brandon. When he preached that Sunday, he got the same kind of post. He got the same post. What does that mean? That means that I'm acknowledging the fact that he's, he's walking in his natural giftings and the anointing. Listen, parents, please, please, from a youth pastor, especially if your kids are not in youth, because you still have a chance to do something for them before they come to me. Make my job easy by listening to what I'm about to say. If you can begin to tell them now that it is just as cool to hit a home run as it is to give somebody a word of knowledge, let me tell you something. You won't have to worry about your children running away. Because even if they do, they'll be like me, and they'll be so scared to actually do anything. Because that's where I was. If anything, I could say this, because I always brag on my parents, but I can't say this. If anything, we got more praise for ministry than other stuff. We did. That's the way it was in my family. But the bottom line is I got to have the right perspective. I got to think of things above, which means I got to recognize that even though my son is amazing at this or my daughter is amazing at this, and they may never, ever, ever, ever want to touch a microphone or get up in front of a group of people, that does not mean that they can't go be a civil engineer and bring the kingdom of God to wherever they are engineering. It does not mean that they can't go be on a lawn business and change the city. If you don't think it's possible, I worked at Cash America for four and a half years, and I watched Jimmy Keller running the store, running the company, making all kinds of money, and he would stop his day, walk outside, give somebody a prophetic word, pray hands on them, and they would be weeping in the parking lot in front of a pawn shop. Really? Yes, really. But the thing is, is most likely, the, the, the problem is, is that the things of God are not usually as honored in our homes as the things of this world. It is what it is. But if we're sowing for what we want to see, we have to let them know that, hey, this stuff is just as important. In my case, it's more important from where I sit. But I understand how you could say it's just as important. But you have to do this. We have to understand. And I'm going to keep going. I want to get ahead of myself. The second thing you need is the right plan. The right plan. The first is the right perspective. The second thing is the right plan. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'll read this to you in the amplified version this morning. That's amplified? Is that what y'all got? Cool. Now this is the instruction, the laws and the precepts, which the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land to which you go to possess it. Now, pause right there. God is giving them what is needed. God is giving them what they have to do to possess the land. They have not possessed the promised land yet. This is the Israelites. They're about to cross the Jordan and go take the promised land. They've been promised for hundreds of years. But God is giving them what they have to do to possess it. Let's keep going. That you may reverently fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, and keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. 
Keep going. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be watchful to do them, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase exceedingly. Everybody who wants big families should be amening when it says increase exceedingly. As the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord, the only Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind and heart and with your entire being and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you this day shall be what? Shall be what? In your own minds and hearts. Stop. It will never be first for them if it isn't first, first for you. If you don't value the gifts of the Spirit equally with whatever you do for a living, your children will not. At dinner time, we should be able to tell our kids, baby, daddy was at work today and somebody was sick and I laid hands on them and their headache went away. That's the kind of stuff we should be able to say. That doesn't make you a preacher. It doesn't make you a full-time evangelist. It makes you a Spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ. In your own minds and hearts, then you shall wet and sharpen them so as to make them penetrate and teach and impress them diligently upon the minds and the hearts of your children. Listen, I understand that our kids are individuals. They're their own people and they have their own wants and desires. But guess what? Someone is going to impress them and penetrate their mind. And it's going to be me through the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be this world. It's not going to be some teacher. It's not going to be some friend. The Word of God is going to be implanted on my children's minds long before they ever have to choose which way they're going to go. So that when the opportunity comes for them to make a choice, the Word of God, which does not return void, is going to rise up on the inside of them and give them this overwhelming argument against making the poor decision and that is the most that I can do as a parent and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up verse 8 and you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets or forehead bands between your eyes and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, I want to take a second here, and I want to preach this, unpack it a little. This is written before they entered the promised land. How many of you are waiting to see your promise still? Especially in the area of your kids. You're waiting to see it. Guess what? Great news. Your best is still yet to come. Your best is still to come because God is not slow in keeping his promises. God does not start something that he does not finish, period. His integrity is so flawless, it, it, it's mind-blowing. So please remove your fear that he won't come through for you because you are not worth his integrity. He's not going to ruin his reputation on you. He can ruin it on me. If he hadn't failed yet, he's not going to start with you. And he's not going to start with me. Now, God explains how they're going to go into the promised land and how they're going to keep the promised land. See, this is what's really cool. Parents, you have to understand what you are fighting for, for your kids, they have to keep. They have to maintain. See, my mom and dad raised us up. To, we, were, we were a ministry family. But guess what? When it became a certain age, it was no longer her job to teach me what it meant to be in ministry. I had to maintain what she fought for. I had to keep it. When the Israelites went in, one generation crossed the Jordan and kicked everybody out. But for generation after generation after generation after generation, the kids had to keep the land that their parents had fought for. And so that's why it's so important to teach them at a young age because as they grow older, they won't depart from it because I don't want to fight for something. I don't want to lay my life down in a prayer closet for something and then pass that baton to my kids and my kids drop the ball. I want to keep the promises that God has given me. I don't want to just experience it for myself. I want to keep it going. But we have to understand that it says two things. It says... First, we have to obey these commandments. In order to leave it, we have to live it. Pastor Derek says it all the time. My kids are never going to become something that I am not unless I give them a reason to. Which means if I live my life before the Lord 
in time, they'll do the same. Because that's my promise in the word. That's not what it looks like. It's hard when it doesn't look right. But his word says that it does not return void. I have to obey these commandments because in order to leave it, to leave a legacy, I have to live a legacy. In, in order to have them walk in faith and do the things I just talked about, if I want them to be anointed and successful, I have to be anointed and successful. But the second thing is that I have to teach them to my children. Now, bringing your kids to church is great. Teaching them to love Jesus is so much cooler. Because, see, when they get to high school, they say, I've been to church my whole life. But they don't know who Jesus is more than I know Barack Obama. But they've been around it. Listen, from a youth pastor's perspective, sometimes I think it's worse for a kid to grow up around it but never have it in them than to never be exposed to it at all. Because, to me, the hardest person to ever reach is a numb church kid. I'll take a heroin addict over a numb church kid. Because what can you tell them? They'll probably beat you in Bible trivia. They've been around forever. But nothing ever got in them. So how do I get it in them? I got to bring them not just to church. I have to bring them into his presence. The same things that keep me and you, they have to experience it now. They have to experience it. Now, I got to worship with them. I have to pray with them. I have to serve with them. I have to get them involved now. This Saturday at the Night of Fire starts at 2 o'clock when I have a worship service at 2 and a worship service at 7. I will not be bothered at all if you and your six kids are here worshiping Jesus. Why? Because there is nothing more valuable than having a son or a daughter see their mother or father worshiping and weeping on their knees in the presence of God. You know why? Because when they get older, they know, man, well, what did daddy do? Daddy was in church praying. Daddy was weeping at the altar. It was a little weird at times because I didn't really get it. But once I grew up and realized how amazing Jesus was, it wasn't weird to me, and I started doing the same thing. I grew up. Whenever my dad, well, he was a private investigator and I was younger, so he was always gone all crazy hours of the morning. But whenever I would wake up and he wouldn't be home, he'd be reading his Bible. If you ask Addison what daddy does in the morning while she eats her breakfast, she's going to tell you he reads his Bible every morning. I'm not just doing that because I need to eat spiritually. I'm doing it because I need to eat, but I got to show her that this meal is just as important as the one you're eating right now. I have to live it if I'm going to leave it to them. When I was a kid... I can remember when I first started really hunting with my dad, we went and he was teaching me gun safety because before you could ever shoot something, you know, you got to know how to work a gun. And I remember there was this one hunting season, we went out and every time we went out, I had the 410, but it was unloaded. And I would walk around with it and I would have it in the boat and I'd have it in a deer stand. And I was never going to shoot it because it never, it never had any bullets with it. But he was teaching me how to hold it and be conscious of it the entire time. And if we walk through the woods and I'd be holding it wrong, he'd say, hey, fix it. Fix the gun. You, hold, you point it down too low. You're going to hit it in the ground. You're pointing it too high. Watch yourself. Blah, 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 blah. There's somebody in front of you. He was constantly teaching me while holding this gun, even though it never had any power in it yet. This, I still had to hold it. Because, listen carefully, if you want your kids to run with it, they have to hold it first. If you want your kids to operate in the anointing and operate in the power of God and operate in the presence of God and be comfortable in it, they have to be around it first. Put them around it. Get them around it. Please, 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 please don't punish your kids from youth. Please, please. We're trying to help them. We're trying to do, well, we are on your team. I am on your, I promise. Whether you believe it or not, I am your biggest ally. Your biggest ally as a, as a parent of a teenager. If you don't believe that, ask some of the parents that their kids have been around a while. I say the same thing that you tell them. They're getting hit both ways. For some reason, they may think I'm cooler than you for a year or two. I don't know why, because I'm not. But that's just the case. 
And the third thing is the right process, the right perspective. And we have the right plan and the right process. Galatians 6, 7, and 9, 7 through 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Keep going. For he who sows to his flesh will reap corruption, and he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And this is the verse for some of you this morning. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, say due season, say it again, say due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Just because it doesn't look like it's working doesn't mean it isn't. Just because I'm not seeing what I am speaking doesn't mean that what I am speaking isn't coming. I'm not talking hyper wishy blab it grab it. I'm talking what the word says. Jesus says that you receive when you ask, not you receive when you receive. You receive when you ask in my name. So what we have to understand is that it isn't going to look like the word says it should look all the time. Because there's a process. But I can't quit. Now, I wanna, I wanna, maybe I can help you this morning with this. Please identify which season you're in. There are three seasons in planting. There's the sowing season, there's the watering season, and there's the harvest season. Please identify which one you're in. Because if you're in the wrong season, you'll be fighting a battle you shouldn't be fighting. How ridiculous would you look if you walked outside most of this year in a big giant down coat, big old down feather coat, a beanie on, boots, gloves, you would look absolutely ridiculous because it is 7,000 degrees too hot most of the year. Thank you, somebody said amen, because it is, I, mean, I think it's hot today. So it was hot all week. I mean, it was a little cooler, but for me it was still hot. But when we're in the wrong season, or we don't recognize what season we're in, we look goofy, and then we end up experiencing things we shouldn't. If, if some of y'all catch this, it's going to be breakthrough for you. A lot of times, we're in a planting season, but we think we're supposed to be in a harvest season. So we're walking around wondering why God's not doing anything for us, and God's saying, I can't do anything, he hasn't planted nothing yet. So we're getting upset with God because we're not seeing and God kind of getting upset with us saying, you ain't planting. So first is planting. But most of the time we understand as Christians, we just keep on sowing. I'm going to keep on giving even though it might stress my bank account out. I'm going to keep on being faithful. I'm going to keep praying. The, the, the planting season is never usually the one we get confused. The ones we get confused are the watering season with the harvest season. In the book of James, I'm not going to go there this morning, but it talks about the farmer. He plants, and then he waits for the rain, and then he waits for the harvest. And it says that he sits there waiting for the harvest. But meanwhile, he waters. And a lot of us are expecting a harvest when we're supposed to be watering. And what is watering? Watering is prayer, intercession, and worship, even though there's nothing coming out of the ground. Nothing. Nothing coming out of the ground. But if I don't identify which season that I'm in, I won't water. And if I don't water, my seed will die. Well, I have got to make sure I know what season I'm in. Because my seed producing is so much more valuable than my seed producing when I want it to. I've got to keep watering and keep watering and keep watering. And just remember this. Most of the time, the biggest trees take the longest to sprout. You may be praying for years. It's okay. Because you're not growing a rose bush. You're growing a redwood. You're not growing a simple little 
blackberry bush. You're growing a sequoia. You're growing an oak tree. So many times we fight the process that God has. Could you imagine if Joseph would have quit one year into being in prison? Could you imagine if Moses would have quit 39 years after walking in a circle? Could you imagine if Jesus would have quit when they put the crown of thorns in his head? No, they all knew what season they were in. They all knew what their role was in that moment. And let me tell you something. I'm not sitting here saying that it's easy because I got some seed in the ground that I've been praying on and watering for a very long time. No, my kids are young, but I've got a lot of spiritual kids. I'd have won the biggest family if I'd have had the movement stand up this morning. But you don't have to be a grandparent to have spiritual legacy. I'm just going to do this because I can. And hopefully they don't get mad at me. I started youth pastoring in 2009. First night we had 29 kids, 31 kids, something like that. And Destiny and Paige were there. And for the entire time that I've been in youth ministry, they have been in my life in some way, shape, or form. Now, there have been times when, I, when we were first around, it was planting. I hung out with them. I spent more time in the Wendy's parking lot with Adam and Nicole and Destiny and Paige, then you could, then anybody should ever spend in the Wendy's parking lot. Because they would kick us out of Wendy's and we had to stay in the parking lot. And I would plant, and I would plant, and I would plant, and I would plant. But then there came this time when it was time for them to move out of youth ministry. And they went and did their own thing. And that was the watering time. And let me tell you something. There was times that I'm in prayer and I'm watering and I can literally remember saying this, Lord, will you please let somebody else pour this can? Because I'm so tired of watering this seed when there ain't nothing coming from it. Because, Lord, Lord, Lord there, there's so many other things I should, I should be planting over here. I should be harvesting. I should be doing something. No, keep watering, Chris. Keep watering. <sighs> 80, 90, 100 kids and youth. God, I got to keep watering. <sighs> Seems like it never ends. Seems like there's absolutely no fruit from it. But then years go by. And earlier this year, I go to preach a message, and Paige comes to church. I didn't even know she was coming. I've been watering. I've told her this. I asked God several times, can I please stop praying for Paige? So many times. But you can't stop praying for your family. You, you, you're bound to them. Spiritual and natural, you are bound to them. If you are my spiritual family, you are stuck with me. Sorry, if you don't like me, move away. You won't see me as much. But I'm not going anywhere. And I'm preaching a message, had no idea she was even coming to church. When I gave the call to the end of service, she walked up to the front and rededicated her life to Jesus. Why? Not because Chris is this great preacher. Not because Chris is this awesome person. It's because I kept watering a seed that wasn't bearing anything. But I knew what I had put in the ground. I knew the power of what I put in the ground. Some of you have got to re-grab and, and, and lock on tighter to the fact that you know that what you put in the ground is the single most powerful thing that has ever, ever, ever existed on this planet. You have put the gospel of Jesus Christ inside of whoever it is that you're planting in. And listen very carefully. There has never been anything more powerful than Jesus himself. And when you put that seed into soil what the soil looks like doesn't matter what grows around it doesn't matter how long it's empty doesn't matter it's what matters is what is on the inside because I can promise you this if you keep watering there's going to be a sprout and then there's going to be a little stem and then there's going to be a tree and before you know it you will be eating the fruit of the seed you planted
You may be here today, you may say, Pastor Chris, it's too late. It's too late. I, I didn't plan early enough. That's the cool part about God. It's like, God don't care when you plant. God controls the times and seasons. You'll be 75 years old, start planting today. God's like, watch this. <laughs> Put up a back of chapter 2 for me. I didn't give you that one. Habakkuk 2, 2 through 4. I'll close with this this morning. Oh, I don't like the way I look on that screen. Man. Well, but just keep looking this way. Praise God. How you doing? Hallelujah. And the Lord said to me, write my answer. Is that amplified? Can you put a new King James? Sorry. Curveball. Put it in, is that New King James? Put it in New King James if you can. Natalie is amazing at all of this. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Keep going. For the vision is yet for an appointed time but at the end, you ain't, it ain't just going to reap. You're not just going to see it. It's going to talk to you. It's going to speak, and it will not lie, though it tarries. Wait for it. It, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Why can Habakkuk make such an emphatic declarative statement about something? Why is he able to say something with such confidence in a situation where you have to look and believe something when you don't see it? Why is he able to say that? Why is he able to say it? It's because he understood the power of what he put in the ground. You have to understand the power of what you've put in the ground. How many parents understand the power of what they put in the ground? Raise your hand. How many of you this morning are still waiting to see what you've put in the ground? Stand up. If you're still waiting to see what you've put in the ground. Now, listen very carefully. What I've been talking about this morning are the three areas. I believe that this morning, we're gonna, we're gonna, this altar call this morning is going to be about us maybe having to repent for not sowing all of what we should. Cody, if you can come. But see, right now, in my, with my daughters and my soon-to-be son, yes. it's planting season for me. It's sowing season for me. Everything I do is a seed. Thank you, Lord. But see, I'm going to sow in them for a while because I don't plan on being a youth pastor for, you know, ever. Somebody else will youth pastor my kids. And I'm believing that the seed I put in the ground, when it's watering season for me, it's going to be planting season for that youth pastor. And that way... Instead of not seeing anything, I can start seeing the changes made when somebody else starts sowing into my kids. One of the greatest honors that I have as a youth pastor is to meet parents who understand, truly understand what I'm doing. Who say, you know what, I don't understand everything you're saying, but I trust you. Go ahead, say what you got to say. Do what you got to do. If you're still, I'll say this. How are we going to close? I've been praying about how we're going to close. And the Lord just gave it to me, so that's cool. We're going to be obedient. We're going to have fun, take pictures, all that good stuff. But I believe God wants to do something real quick. If you're here this morning, you can say, Pastor Chris, I know for a fact that right now, whether you're standing or not, actually, everybody's standing this morning. Everybody's standing. If you're here this morning, you can say, Pastor Chris, I know for a fact whether, you, whether you're Christians or not, whether you attend here or not, that's what I'm talking about this morning. If you know for a fact that you need to make some adjustments in what you're sowing. 
if you know that you know that I'm not saying you've been sowing terrible but maybe you need to adjust a little bit in how you're sowing maybe you adjust a little bit in what you're portraying to your kids what you're valuing in your home what, what you're letting them know is the pinnacle and, and everything else maybe you need to say you know what I gotta make a change in how I structure things in my home if that's you I want you to come stand over here this morning if you could say I, I need I need to change a few things in my house Like I said, this is not you saying, I'm a terrible parent. This is you saying, you know what? I could do a better job with the seed I have. I could do a better job with how I sow. On this side, if you're here this morning, you could say, I know I did everything I could to plant like I was supposed to, but I need grace to water it. I want you to stand over here. I know I did what I was supposed to do, but I need grace to water what I have in the ground. This side may not be as packed. It's okay. And I'll make this last thing. This isn't just a call for parents. This isn't just a call for marriages. Some of you have been sowing. Some of you young people, some of you youth, you've been believing for God to save your parents. Get up here if you haven't seen it yet respond to what God is doing. Some of you are believing that God's going to restore your family. God's going to bring healing in certain areas. Get up here and say, no, God, I haven't seen it yet, but I know what I put in the ground is more powerful than what's looking me in the face. what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to just pray. I'm going to ask Pastor Bonnie to come here and put her on the spot. I'm going to pray for this group here to make the proper adjustments in, in the planting, but I want you to pray for grace to keep watering. You can do that? Sure you can. Oh, well, I'm going to give you the mic and then pray over them. If you're over here, just lift your hands this morning. Father, I thank you for the humility. I thank you, God, for the, for the honesty to say that I need to adjust how I, how I plant. I need to adjust how I sow. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would give them, God, the, the wisdom, give them the strategy, God, give them the, the ability, God, and the connections, the relationship connections. Father, God, to learn how to sow, to learn how to do it more effectively. Father, I pray that they, Father, God, would be good stewards of the seed you've given them, God, and that they would begin to plant with the mindset of knowing how powerful the seed is. I thank you, Father God, right now that if they're here and, and they're feeling maybe my kids are too old or, or what I've been believing is too late, I pray, Father, right now in Jesus' name that you would remove all limitations off of faith and that you would allow us to grow this morning in the fact that nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is impossible for you. And we thank you, God, that the seeds that we are putting in the ground today, we will see harvest. I thank you, God, for the callings and the purpose purposes inside young people. I thank you for the marriages that we're calling out. I thank you, God, for the restoration of marriages, for the restoration of families. I thank you right now for every seed that has been planted. I speak life to every seed. I rebuke the devourer in the name of Jesus. I pray right now, Father God, that no weapon formed against that seed shall be able to prosper. And I thank you right now. That we will rejoice, as my mom said earlier, when one rejoices, we all rejoice. We're going to rejoice when the seeds that are in the ground begin to harvest. In Jesus' name, if you agree, say amen. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the watering process, God. And I thank you, Lord, that we stand. And as God, we continue to water, Lord. Sometimes we look and we see nothing coming forth, God. We look at the ground and all we see is just the soil and the mud, God. But Lord, I pray that your word, we just heard it, God. That if we do not give up and do not faint, God, that we're going to reap a harvest. I pray for each parent and grandparent here today, God, 
that you would help us to water in worship, God, to water in prayer, God, to water in war, God, over our seed. Father, I ask you, God, that we would begin to see, call forth, that we would just not see it, but would begin to call forth as we look at that dry ground, as we look at that muddy ground, God, that we would begin to call forth those righteous oaks, oh God, as we water. Father, that we would begin to see that seed as what it's going to be and not what it is right now, God. I pray, Father, that you would call each one of us, oh God, to be more of a worshiper. That you would call us to be more of a prayer warrior, oh God, over our seed. God, that you would cause us that the things of this world, God, would grow strangely dim, Father. That our eyes would be focused, oh God, on the watering of our seed, God. Lord, help us, Jesus, to call forth the oaks of righteousness, oh God. Father, I thank you, Lord, that God, because sometimes the watering and being out in the sun and being out in the elements doing our watering, oh God, starts to beat us down and it, because we don't see anything coming forth. But God, we know that what we've planted in faith and what we water now, that the increase will come, God. Help these parents and grandparents that are pouring and watering into their seed, God, to reap a mighty harvest, God. I decree and declare for every seed planted in the ground, God, that the mighty oak of righteousness is coming forth. Help us, God. We give all the glory to you, Jesus. We give all the glory to you, God. Lord, and I thank you, Jesus, that not one seed, not one seed that is planted in that ground, and God, not one seed, we decree and declare right now that every seed that has been planted in that ground takes root and comes forth as an oak tree in the name of Jesus. We decree it and declare it now. No matter what it looks like, God, we see the mighty oak coming forth now in the name of Jesus. We will not waver. We will not get weary. But we will reap a harvest because we will not faint. We refuse to faint and give up, God. Lord, help them be at going after this little baby seed. Let them go after that little baby seed of watering, watering, just as they would go after the most precious thing in the world that they would want. So as much as they go after their jobs, God, as much as they go after their vacations, God, as much as they go after their bank accounts, God, as much as they go after the brand new home, God, let them go after that seed, Father, and more... Let it go. Let them go after that seed, God, more than they want the things of this world. We thank you, Lord, and I thank you for right now. We thank you for the seeds that are coming up. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your power and your strength and your might. In Jesus' name, Amen.